Hi everyone, David Evans, culinary specialist here in Ontario. Uh, welcome to our 2021 spring uh, food show. Today we're going to give you a little presentation about delivering flavour to drive sales. Uh, it's a presentation that was uh, compiled by Chef Nicholas Goring, a uh, corporate uh, consulting chef in Grand Rapids. Um, we've had some additional information from, from myself, Chef Michael Viola in British Columbia, Chef Stefan Renault in uh, Montreal, and Teresa Weller, one of our um, specialists here in Ontario. So let's go. As we're going to break the agenda down into two parts, really. Uh, street level and media research. And at the street level, we want to talk about uh, Nick's culinary trend uh, research overview. And from the culinary trends, uh, we learn a lot more about Unami. We'll dive into Unami, and then in part two, we'll talk about the trends that the media and the research that we do by analyzing all those different trends. So street level trends research. Uh, this year, the team in Grand Rapids did their 18th year of uh, conducting street level research. They go to the three largest uh, trend driving cities that they've identified as Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles. Uh, we find that these cities are influential to the rest of the country. So what they do is they seek out newly opened restaurants because it's the, from their experience, it's the newly opened restaurants that uh, drive uh, innovation. So how do they ascertain what restaurants to visit? Well, throughout the year, they analyze uh, digital publications, uh, blogs, magazines, journals, industry papers, anything they can get their hands on. Constantly, constantly looking to see who's opening, what's happening, and what the media and the internet are saying about these restaurants. At any given time, they might have 500 candidates to look at. And they narrow that down usually to about 120 restaurants in between the three cities. New York City, uh, this year, they uh, went to two boroughs, 41 restaurants, and tasted 414 dishes. Uh, this year, they broke out a little bit. Instead of being in down in Manhattan, they've spread out into Brooklyn and some of the other boroughs. When they go to these locations, they look at the menus in detail, scan them, analyze them, and then take professional photos of all the dishes that they taste. In Chicago, they visited 11 neighborhoods, went to 39 different restaurants, and tasted and photographed 362 different dishes. And then in Chicago, again, out into some of the boroughs and the districts, some really, really hot little food cities in the West Loop, Wicker Park, River North, Ukrainian Village, and Lincoln Park. Really, really hot food, food, food scene in Lincoln Park out of Chicago, in Chicago. In Los Angeles, they went to eight cities of Los Angeles, visited 35 restaurant and restaurants, and tasted 384 dishes. Los Angeles is a fantastic city, but it covers a lot of ground, so spread out through Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, Studio City, Venice Beach, Culver City. A lot of ground to cover, but some really, really interesting restaurants in this town. So what happens after visiting all these restaurants and tasting all these dishes, taking all these photos? The team bring back their documentation to the home office and they try and work out the commonalities and the similarities, the differences between the East Coast and the West Coast. And they want to see what they're uh, really discovering and see the things that possibly weren't even on their radar that they thought that they were looking for. Each year, out of all of this research, about 200 of the recipes are recreated in the test kitchens in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And these are what we call kitchen tested recipes to show to our customers what can be achieved by looking at the trends that are happening around the globe. This year, the team discovered the commonalities of Unami in almost everything that they saw. So we're going to break Unami down for you. And there's been a lot of talk of Umami lately, especially about monosodium glutamate. I've seen a lot of stuff that chefs are putting out there on the internet. So uh, is monosodium glutamate bad? 
I'm not going to say, but I know that umami is being clar- classified as like the fifth taste. We know bitter, sour, salty, and sweet. But when we eat foods that are rich in umami compounds, they coat all of the tongue and stimulate the brain. When we taste foods that are rich in umami compounds, our tongues naturally start to salivate as the umami coats our palate. It triggers a message to our brain that we receive a highly pleasurable taste. Since umami-based ingredients leave behind lingering flavours of sensation, it deposits a flavour memory in our mind. Because of this, we crave specific flavours. So what does that mean and how do we use it to our advantage on our menus? When we eat foods that are high in umami compounds, it enhances the flavor, it drives the craveability, it brings on repeat customers, it increases our sales, and it's used in all day parts and all segments. It improves food consumption in senior communities and it's in a lot of our pantry ingredients. And this is what we've discovered in a lot of the recipes in this year's tour. Types of umami, they're amino acids or proteins and they're found in vegetables and in meats. You got your glutamate, your isoamate and your glyonate. Let's take a look into the five umami categories. We've got our sea, our fermentation, mushrooms, yeasts and meats. From the sea, got nori, seaweed, kombu, kelp, seaweed, katsubushi, caviar, noshibi, little tiny little white fish, taragashi, the spice, pukiyaki, the seasoning mix, uh, wukimi, seaweed again, botagara, the uh, roe, uh, neonata, and anchovies. All of these flavors from the sea give off a really craveable compound. So what did the team discover out of all the restaurants that they saw that was rich in sea unami? This dish was outstanding. The uh, spicy roasted rice cakes from uh, David Chang's new restaurant, Kwai in New York City. It's down in the Hudson Yards. It had uh, a chili jam and some ham and fukiyaki. Another dish that was really outstanding, bringing in the flavors of seaweed, uh, was this uh, Morimoto tomatoes. A house-made ricotta, a whipped ricotta that we'll talk about a little bit more. Ricotta was another big trend that they saw many, many times over on their tour. Little Thai basil, rice pearls, garlic, and a country loaf. A real smash up of Italian and Asian flavors here. Bringing Unami flavors, into a more traditional dish. In the Fulton district, Chef Jean-Georges Bollerichten uses the seaweed here to amplify the chicory or endive. Uh, simply placing seaweed in the food processor to make the vinaigrette is gonna enhance the flavor of that vinaigrette, giving it a unami characteristics. Here, vegetable dumplings and rice cake in a beef broth with egg noodles and nori, the seaweed enhancing the flavor. Perilla leaf bimbap. Perilla leaf uh, is part of the mint family, very much like a shishito pepper, uh, a tuna sashimi, a spice cured cod roe, salmon roe, carrots, noodles, and salad scallions. The roe is the unami effect that enhances the palate. Something again that we all serve in most of our restaurants is bread. But the bread service can be enhanced by incorporating a little seaweed into the butter. Here, the chefs at Hayeno have a spicy bulla base. Codfish, clams, mussels, grilled shrimp, scallop, rice cakes, and salmon roe with a side of seaweed butter. So a bit of a zuppa de pesci meets Asia. Scallop skewers, lime mayo, ginger, and taragashi. Taragashi spice, already available for you to use and bring unami flavors to your menus with great ease. Roasted corn, again, with toragashi, soya, yuzu, and mirin. Yuzu is on uh, this year's hot list of flavor profiles. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Again, toragashi as a rub, 
on some chicken wings. Very, very simple, but very, very modern and bringing those unami characteristics simply to your menu. Here at Black Ship in Los Angeles, radicchio salad, sesame, watermelon radish, toasted bread, fukiyaki, butternut squash, and vinaigrette. Fukiyaki, we play around with a lot here in our test kitchens in Milton. Uh, every, just about every Japanese kid has a bottle of fukiyaki in his backpack that he takes to school every day to put on his rice for lunch. Again, at Black Ship in Los Angeles, grilled mataki mushrooms, salsa verde, ajiki seaweed, and scallions. We have a Aura King salmon, pan seared, sauteed with burnt miso, seaweed, and wasabi. The miso and the seaweed, the big umami characteristics bring big flavor to this salmon dish. Again, at Hayino, a sable fish, pan sauteed and simmered with soya garlic and wakimi. Coast to coast, we were just in LA, and now we're over in New York City again at Racine, grilled and chilled leeks, heirloom celery, white miso, celery, dashi ju, micro celery, and leaves. Very, very much a root to seed kind of a dish incorporating umami flavor. Here at Pacific, uh, blistered shishitos with a squid ink aioli. Beautiful color in this dish. The squid ink again, bringing a bold color and mixing it with the unami flavors. We've got uh, squid ink shells, uni toast, trout roe, borotaga, and chipotle butter. Something a little more familiar, especially to me, is tarama salada. And yeah, the fish roe, or the that tarama salada is made from, is full of unami compounds. Here, it's been kicked up in a bit of an Asian uh, sort of spin. Uh, salty dry cured cod blended with olive oil and lemon and the potatoes, chives and the tobacco garnish. Restaurant called Tartine, specializing in bread and tartines. We've got a coddled egg with cured trout roe, za'atar toast and chive. Smoked trout roe dip, cream fresh, chives, eggs with trout roe. The roe full of unami characteristics. Here, David Chang has got a kwai bap, candied anchovy, Japanese omelet inside a nori roll served with an ounce of uni, uni sorry, and an ounce of trout roll. Here, a pin roast Caesar. Caesar that we know and love already has anchovies in the dressing for the most part. A garlic croutons, unami flavor. This way, they've used toya flakes in the spicy sea. Toya is a little uh, white fish. Uh, traditionally from the Philippines. Uh, here's uh, a PNC, a Botaraga onion dip with cured mullet roe and chives. In the jungle room, you can have grilled avocados, almonds, ponzu, and warm salt. Ponzu being your lime infused soy, enhancing the flavor, bringing out unami characteristics to your avocados. Here at Marlowe and Daughters, we have a smoked ham focaccia bread uh, with greens, provolone, couchons, and tonato, bringing in that unami characteristic to something very, very traditional as ham on a focaccia. Yucca fries, avocado, kimchi, sriracha, mayo, and bonito flakes, giving unami pop to yucca fries. At Royale, a radish pasta, radish noodles, uni butter, grilled radish, dashi, and smoked trout roll. Three elements from the sea, bringing a radish noodle to life. Lastly, for our unami from the sea, we got a Lampia Shanghai chicken and shrimp with exo sauce, one of my favorites, uh, dried scallop and uh, dried shrimp. Um, some cured egg yolk, sweet chili, and sauce at Sara. Let's move on to unami flavors that come from fermentation. Get your fish sauce, 
your oyster sauce, soy sauce, miso paste, kimchi, black garlic, soya beans, and liquid amino acids are all fermented flavors of unami. And we saw these appear in dishes like the parsnips here, roasted in exo sauce, miju dates, labini, finger lime, and Korean chives. Black ship in Los Angeles, a Namin Ranch meatball, tamari glazed polenta, wasabi relish, and Japanese cucumber. Here at Black Ship in Los Angeles, a TKG arancini, unami from the soy sauce with the Chino Valley egg yolk, working with local farmers and naming where they're getting their supplies and produce from. At back at Pacific, a lamb shoulder skewer with kuchijang, cumin, and scallion. Kuchijang being a Korean spicy red pepper paste that we've seen trending in our flavor profiles. We'll talk to that a little bit more as we get to the second part of the presentation. Here at Makani, got an ember roasted purple cabbage from Flora Bella Farms, Thai bird chilies with fish sauce, cilantro, and yellow jalapeno. A vegetarian dish uh, following along from the trends that we've been seeing of uh, vegetable forward menu presentations. Cauliflower popcorn. Tempura popcorn with yuzu kosho and banakota. Banakota uh, is a garlic and anchovy paste uh, from the north of Italy. Got a little bit of lime in that dish too. You can see the banakuta there on the left. So here's a traditional take on uh, a French breakfast. Radish with yumboishi butter from Oi Chef. Adding fermentation to a pancake at Hayino. They've got mung beans and kimchi. Here at Peach Mart, we've got a chicken katsu sando, cabbage, kewpie mayo, bulldog sauce in the white milk bread. Katsu sandwiches, big, big trend that we've seen pop up all across the nation. Here at Oi Chef, we have a beef tongue sando with gribish and tongatsu sauce. Mixing up those Asian and traditional French flavors. Again, Oi Chef, combination of cauliflower, okonomiyaki with hazelnuts, traditional French, bulldog sauce, and kewpie mayo and scallions. Fantastic fusion cuisine. In the jungle room, pot roasted cauliflower with a black garlic and mole. A beatnik, charred broccoli, Nok cham, sunflower hummus, pomegranate seeds, and puffed rice. Very, very cool dish. At Somerset, again, charred broccoli, black garlic, almonds, yogurt, and crispy chicken skin. So not only are some of these dishes incorporating the ferment unami flavors, but now we're bringing in lots of crunchy, crispy, smooth, and creamy elements. So we've got flavor and texture. Chinese broccoli, salt and pepper tofu, and fermented black beans with citrus. At Onda, we've got a koji marinated satsuma sweet potato, salsa matcha, house crema, koji, and heirloom corn tortilla. Next umami flavor we'll explore is mushrooms. You got your samijis, your enokis, your common mushrooms, your dried shiitake, Mitsuki, morels, truffles, and porcinis. Here at Pacific, cast iron mataki mushrooms with sake, yuzu butter, and scallions. Simple, but very, very flavorful. Here at Birdie G's, they've got a creamy grits and toll polenta. Mushrooms, relish, woody herbs, and Neil's Yards cool and cheese, naming the local purveyors where they're sourcing their ingredient from. Here at Mizzi, we've got a taglatelli, a house-made pasta, matsutake mushrooms, mint, and parmigiano. Cultural smash-up of uh, Italian and Asian, bringing those 
uh, umami-rich mushrooms to the forefront. Here at Electric Lemon, we've got a warm grain porridge, mataki and white and black beach mushrooms, and from Wild Hive Farms, we've got a bunch of their grains, including millet, corn, spring wheat, winter wheat, flax, chia, sunflower seeds, quinoa, uh, topped with fried shallots and a soft cooked egg. Here at PNC, a cured Arctic char, baby French breakfast radish, ginger, habanero, coriander, mushroom dashi, pineapple brunoise, chive and dill. The mushroom flavor from the unami coming from the, the, the mushroom dashi. Uh, and we've seen a little bit now of uh, breakfast radish, another underlying trend that was discovered throughout the tour. At Somerset, grilled mataki mushrooms, watercress, sunflower seeds, and miso. So dipping into two anami flavors with the mushrooms and the miso. Lastly, from our mushroom section, heritage in Chicago, sweet corn and wood grilled vegetable ramen, dujang, yellow miso, wild mushrooms and kimchi. Very heavily Korean influenced dish right now. Throughout the research tour, we discovered unami flavors being brought into the dishes with bacteria and yeast. Parmigiano Reggiano, Emmental, Cabrales, Cheddar, Matcha, green leaf tea, dried tomatoes and flake nutritional yeast. Seen some other trends around the world, uh, Marmite and Vegemite for the English and the Australians amongst us who uh, know these uh, yeast byproducts that people tend to spread on their toasts. Uh, flake nutritional yeast too, the last flavor there is uh, we're seeing a lot for vegetarian cheese. Uh, ground um, cashew nuts and nutritional yeast make a great uh, vegetarian or vegan substitute for Parmigiano Reggiano. Here at Oi Chef, with their mix up of uh, Asian and French flavors, profiteroles rolls with ginger and matcha creme anglaise. A few years ago on the uh, research tours, the chefs discovered matcha, and now it's becoming more and more and more mainstream. Winston Bakery, Lukban Zangjeo, egg, raclette, braised pork knuckle, ginger, Deluxe, or ginger deluxe sauce on a milky bun. A very, very craveable sandwich right there. These are again, we have fennel, shaved fennel with celery, parmigiano and walnuts. Very simple, straightforward looking French style dish with all kinds of umami flavor from the parmigiano. At the Jones, a chopped steak, raclette, crispy potatoes and tarragon oil. Also at the Jones, a gem lettuce with manchego, macona almonds, parmesano reggiano, red onion, and sherry vinaigrette. Here at Eden, umami donuts, roasted mushroom miso, and a warm raclette cheese sauce. Taking a look now at umami from meat sauces, lap chong, Chinese sausage, nuja, cured hams, eggs, dry aged beef and prosciutto di parma. Here at Auden Broadway, we have an oxtail adobo with bone marrow, the oxtail adobo, roasted bone marrow, crostini and shallot relish. At Birdie G's in Santa Monica, sauerkraut cakes, corned beef, gribbens crackling, lemon zest, aioli and chives. Umami flavors being driven from the Gravens crackling, which is uh, the crispy fried chicken skins. Here at Windrose, a truffle to yolk and cheese, rice gnocchi, cheese bechamel, Korean chili powder, and pork rind crumbles. At Margol, market lettuces, buttermilk herb dressing, sunflower seeds, apple, and serrano ham crackling. Unami flavor coming in from the crispy ham crackling. 
the most valuable player in Los Angeles as what they call the ROC. Taiwanese salt and pepper fried chicken with lap chong, user slaw and rice. Here at Winds and Bakery, a fan tongue, pork floss, rice roll with egg and Chinese crula. Here we have a veal de pepe, horseradish, speck and rye, banana peppers, pickled mustard seeds, arugula and lemon. Here at PNC, lamb meatballs, dry aged lamb and ribeye fat braised with frisee, pomegranate seeds, tomato sauce, and yogurt vinaigrette. Very, very unami rich dish here with the lamb and the ribeye fat. Again, a PNC, an arugula salad, the frisee, cured pork, jao lardons, reggiano, anchovy vinaigrette, butter toasted breadcrumbs, and dill. Double up on the unami with the cured pork, jao lardons, and the anchovy vinaigrette. Back to Winds and Bakery, a turnip cake with Betton's ham, dried shrimp, chili vinaigrette, chili crisps, chili oil, and black vinegar. So lots of unami flavors being incorporated into this dish from all segments. Here back to Mizi, we got grilled beets, lardo, balsamic, and pink peppercorns. A beautiful service here of breads at Intersect, Cholula, pita, onion pate, with schmaltz, pickled cucumbers, and radishes. At Play-Doh, the breads were assorted crustinis with bajon, cream, cheese, and lime, nuja, and caramelized onion. At Play-Doh Tasting Bar, we have a chorizo dish. Sliced Spanish sausage, sauteed in garlic with faba beans and lemon. Here at the Jones, Suriano ham, artisan Virginia ham, straight up unami flavor. At the Somerset, grilled heirloom carrots, smoked feta, dates, and nuja. A gorgeous looking dish. And lastly, from our tour of Chicago, New York, and Los Angeles, at Somerset, dry aged beef tatar, shiitake mushrooms, pickled mustard seeds, and pickled radish with dill. Another beef unami influence. So now that we've toured across the states and we've seen what the chefs have uh, experienced by finding the commonalities of unami through many, many, many dishes that they experienced, we also did these tours in Canada, albeit because of COVID, was a little while back. And we did a, a, a Calgary tour we didn't visit many, many cities like uh, the folks in the US did, but we did pop into Calgary and visit 20 restaurants and a food hall. We did find commonalities and document them, what the trends are from what people are serving, just as they did in the US. These are the restaurants that we visited in Calgary. Trends and commonalities in the food we found Pickling and fermentation was big. Unami, freshwater fish, old classics with a new spin. Local, micro local and regional, stuffed starch with elevated fillings. If you think back to the slides that we just saw from the Unami portion of the presentation from the US tour, as yeah, there were old classics with a new spin. There was a lot of local uh being used and they were naming the places where uh, the uh, produce and the uh, proteins were from charring and smoking we saw a lot of in calgary we saw a lot of solid fuel burning uh, veg centric which we all know has been a trend for a little while and isn't really a trend but i think it's a here to stay lots and lots of avocado on menus in calgary we saw elevated breakfasts Breakfasts that were classics with a new twist. Dehydrated ingredients too were prominent. Open concept kitchens, dry aging of meats was very, very common. A lot of microgreens being used. Korean barbecue style. Uh, charcuterie was everywhere. We saw greens and veggies, 
multiple uses for the same food plant per plate, a very root to seed application, miso heavily featured, global smash ups and citrus were all very predominant. Trends and commonality that we saw in the menus, the menus were clean and simple in design, inexpensive menu prints, very clean font styles, very simple and elegant descriptions, small plates and large plates were categories that were featured on menus, enhanced side dishes, lack of bundling was absent, and the pricing was what we call rag or right side pricing. On beverage menus, commonalities we saw is boozy brunch, kombucha was very, very popular with and without alcohol, and that is a trend that uh, is emerging very much now across the continent. Cold brew was very popular and nitro coffee. We're seeing that emerging as well. Non-alcoholic beverages, spiritless and crafted cocktails, very popular on menus. Classic cocktails, old school cocktails were everywhere. They had a great cocktail scene there uh, that had been tweaked for individual standouts based upon the establishment. Drink garnishes were elevated. Some places had uh, a large selection of dehydrated garnishes. Artful ice was also very popular, uh, specifically tailored to the drinks. Some of the trends and commonalities we saw in the ambience are on the tabletop. A lot of restaurant designs that were rustic with exposed brick, barn wood with a farmhouse feel. A lot of shared small plates a lot of mixed plates, a very relaxed employee uniforms were a commonality that we saw. Long table service and shared table service was very popular. Semi-private dining rooms and chef's tables were also popular. We saw a lot of open kitchens. Visibility into the kitchen was very common. Platters and large bowls used for many presentations. Lots of pottery, very rustic looking dishware. Uh, and music we found in a lot of the restaurants was matched to the matched to the style of the restaurant very, very well. We could tell that in some of the restaurants that we went to that the, the consideration for the playlist was being done very, very carefully to give a fantastic overall ambiance. Glassware and cutlery sometimes in some plates were mixed matched. They were afterthoughts, but we did see a lot of classic glassware that is now very popular uh, in, across the nation, crafty, whatever is old is new again in that, in that glassware style. So we can deduce trends by what we have seen being served in restaurants, but we also get fed trends through the media. What the media are telling us is coming up or what the media is analyzing as being the new greatest flavor or the new greatest trend. Uh, here, we do that by looking at all kinds of different documentation from technomic, flavor in the menu, the Kerry food ingredient taste chart, the Mintel global food trends deck, and also our own uh, research from Marcon. I really, really love our Marcon research. Um, the people at Marcon delve deeply into a lot of different trend documentation, as you can see here on the right of this slide. And then they see the commonalities throughout all the different trend research companies and they bring it together with their hot list. If you, can, uh, if you don't have the opportunity to see this, please reach out to your district sales representative. He can uh, get you the quarterly mark on trends that come out seasonally. I really, really like this document. I find a lot, a lot of information in there. And what it does is it clarifies in my mind all the other stuff that I read and brings it together tied up in one really, really neat bundle. So the different trends across the country uh, compiled by some of our chefs. A chef, Michael Viola in British Columbia, puts together an awesome video of his trends at the beginning of each year. So I'm gonna pause for a second and stop my talking and let you watch this fantastic video.
I hope you enjoyed that. It's a pretty fast moving piece. So I've typed in a little uh, slide here to review what Michael believes are some of uh, 2021's hot new flavor trends. Chickpeas, garbanzo beans are being used. We've seen the emergence of uh, plant-based foods and that's carrying on to plant-based jerkies, whole grains. We saw that back in some of our US presentation. There were some dishes that were using a myriad of whole grains. Big breakfast and breakfast charcuterie and advanced breakfast. Michael says that sees that as a trend and we saw some interesting uh, breakfast uh, unami uh, dishes using uh, breakfast radish back in our American trends. Kombucha, goozy kombucha, that's uh, tracking. We've seen that a lot on a lot of menus and, and that came out way back in the middle of 2019. We saw that emerging in Calgary. Sauerkraut, trending by Chef Michael. A few dishes, uh, a number of dishes uh, from the US research, there was sauerkraut. Alternative oils, other oils, I see a lot of hemp and coconut oil being used uh, on recipes and menus. Coffee re-emerging as a trend and coffee flavors, but not just appearing as the drink, but turning up in rubs and in sauces and uh, other, part, other day parts of the menu. Upcycled food, food that traditionally we might have uh, wasted, but making sure that we get the most out of it from a nutritional and flavor perspective. A root to seed style of cooking. Uh, we've seen root to seed around for a few years now, but it's uh, it's uh, it's it's here and it's uh, using the all of the plant on the plate in many different facets. Snackability. This day and age, the way our lifestyles have gone, we tend to snack a little bit more than what we did. We're grazing and eating more smaller meals through the day. So snackability and snack charcuterie are on Michael's top ten. Uh, new trends and flavors. So I do a little bit of uh, research myself and I dive down into some of the things that I saw as the hot 10 new and there might be a few commonalities between uh, Stefan, Michael and myself. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, dessert, breakfast and snack charcuterie appearing on menus. Uh, Spice 101, masala chai and truffle hot sauce. I don't know if uh, you've seen too much, but the on the, the internet's been been a buzz with uh, some of these hot uh, new uh, truffle hot sauce companies. We uh, had the Buddha bowl, but now we're seeing power performance bowls and bars. Nude foods is a bar, uh, you know, a meal in a bar that's emerging. Upcycled foods, or I called it the war on waste. Michael referred to that root to seed, things like crispy salmon skin uh, served as a garnish uh, for a salmon dish. Why, why, why throw it away when it can be uh, rolled in rice flour and deep fried and served up on the dish? Kombucha, a boozy kombucha we're seeing a lot of. Seaweed, that's straight to the unami that we saw in the US. Seaweed incorporated into many, many dishes in many, many cultures to uh, add, add unami. House-made vegan cheese and bacon. Uh, I've seen a lot of coconut bacon. People using um, flake nutritional yeast and nuts to make uh, vegan cheese. Seeing comfort bake coming back with a new spin. Uh, spaghetti and meatball muffins, lasagna pie, uh, infused and flavored uh, potato au gratin, harvest casseroles, crustless Focaccia and exotic mac and cheese, all those comfort baked things, but taken uh, to a new level. Uh, vegetarian and vegan en croute probably could come into that category, but a lot of uh, spins on old school recipes like Wellington, beef Wellington or uh, Kubliak, things that are wrapped en croute in pastry that have a, a vegetable forward uh, menu drive. Zero waste takeout. Uh, there's a new program called Loop, which is uh, bringing and um, packaging uh, re reusable uh, containers in the supermarket industry. You can now buy your Hagen Dust in a in a metal tin for an extra five dollars, and uh, take it back or send it back to Loop, and they'll rewash it and repackage uh, 
ice cream into it. Uh, tiffins are being used in restaurants around the world. Australia has a huge tiffin uh, program in restaurants where you take in your tiffin tin and have it filled with your food. Uh, next time you return to the restaurant, you give them the tiffin, they keep it, wash it, and uh, put food in a secondhand tiffin and give it to you. At McGill University, they have a great system called the Aussie system where they're taking uh, plastic uh, food containers re that are rewashable and reusable and uh, serving the students up meals again. So uh, zero waste takeout is uh, coming our way. One of our other team members, Chef Stefan, has identified 10 hot new trends and flavors. He believes that uh, eating local flexitarian will be a big boom. Uh, citrus, ginger, and berries are the flavors uh, trend of immunity boosting for 2021. Comfort food, culinary tourism, and indulgence all morphed in together for a big trend. Zero waste and upcycled food, little commonality there from all the chefs. We all, all believe that the, this is possibly not a trend, but a, 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 maybe a necessity for us to uh, support the planet body health and mood booster drinks, beverages with reduced sugar, beverages with CBD, uh, uh, antioxidants, and clean label beverages are all gonna come to the forefront. Technology is a big one. QR codes, non-contact payment, uh, virtual menus, and online ordering have all uh, come to the forefront, I believe, because of the current global situation. And I think we'll just stay and be part of our new norm. Omnichannel POS, dining in, curbside delivery, takeout, and third party delivery, all on Chef Stefan's list of hot new trends for 2021. Dark kitchens or back of house kitchen concepts. We've heard the word ghost kitchen. Uh, that is a new norm, I think, that's here to stay. Restaurant brands in people's homes and restaurant membership with perks. That's something that's uh, it's, it's new to me, restaurant brands in people's homes. I, I, I don't know how that's gonna play out, but uh, it's interesting conversation that we should be having. The ideal packaging, eco-responsibility, techno-savvy and shapeable and customizable packaging is on the forefront for a hot new trend. Over the last couple of years, one of our team members, Teresa Weller, has been putting together some slides and getting some information on the influence of color. And this year, the last couple of years, these decks have really, really stood out in my mind because of the way that in the beginning of the year um, were the predictions or, or the new statements on what would be the color of the year. And as the year uh, unfolded, I would see those colors come into dishes. Uh, 2019, for instance, was this coral pink color. And by the end of the year, we saw foods with that flavor emerging as popular flavor profiles. I, 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 until I started to really look at it, it didn't hit home. But last year in 2020, when uh, classic blueberry was named the color of the year. By the end of the year, some of the things that I was seeing in the media with this blue color in our food, like the um, blue spirulina and berries in the photo on the right were, were, were quite stunning. So I'm gonna give you a little presentation of what uh, Teresa sees as the color of the year. What's the color of the year for 2021? There's actually two colors chosen for the year uh, for 2021. Uh, those elements come together to support one another. Uh, these are best express the mood uh, for the year really. Uh, practical and rock solid at the same time, warming and optimistic. Uh, the unions of ultimate gray and uh, illuminate yellow uh, give off the uh, notion of strength and positivity. Uh, the story of these colors, they encapsulate deeper feelings and thoughtfulness uh, with a promise of something uh, sunny and friendly. Uh, I think that's pretty indicative of uh, the times at hand. So uh, they're looking for a little positivity, warmth and uh, thoughtfulness, uh, and that's gonna transpose through into our food. Uh, 
for over 20 years, uh, Panatone have influenced colors. And those colors have sort of trickled through into many, many facets of our lives. But uh, food is one of them that makes a big impact that I found. And uh, moving forward, I think we might see a little bit of gray in some of our foods uh, that's going to convey some practicality and uh, rock solid uh, attitude. Gray gives a, a, a feeling of strength, uh, thoughtfulness. Uh, gray gives a message of fortitude. So how does that transpose to food? Fish, mackerel, sardines, uh, gray in color and kind of evoke those uh, things that I just described. Strength, thoughtfulness, uh, fortitude. Oysters, yeah. Chia seeds, dragon fruit, uh, charcoal in ice cream and smoothies. Uh, in buns, we saw charcoal in buns and in pizza crusts. So uh, an influence that might come through is a little gray in our food and potentially too into the plateware that we eat our food from. And then bringing in that uh, optimistic is, is yellow foods. So illuminating yellow is the other uh, color of the year. This gives off warming, uh, optimistic feelings, feelings of positivity, promise of something sunny and friendly. Oh, gee, we need that. Uh, a message of happiness, uh, an aspiration that gives us hope. And in yellow, uh, in illuminating yellow flavors uh, that match the color, uh, lemons, user, yeah, user is the flavor and the color of the year. Jeff Stefan mentioned that, and we saw that back in the tour and research in the US, in uh, California, Chicago, and New York, user was a flavor that was being used. Uh, lemon flesh potatoes, Yukon gold potatoes, yellow peppers and tomatoes, pineapple, corn, lemon meringue pie, and egg yolks, all evoking uh, warm and optimistic positivity. So if you marry that warm and uh, positive, uh, optimistic with uh, practicality and rock solid strength of gray, you get the foods and the, and the colors of the year. Uh, that's about it for me. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, listening in. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks to uh, Chef Stefan, Michael, Teresa, and especially to Chef Nick for all of his hard work in bringing together and educating us about how using an army in, in our flavor profiles can uh, drive sales. Thank you very much, everybody.